In the fall of 2006, my life stopped making sense. I was a year away from graduating with a degree in physics, and I just realized I really didn't want to be a physicist. Now, normally, this wouldn't be a big issue. My life stops making sense on a regular basis. The only thing I've always wanted to do is write science fiction. I've always wanted to write about giant robots. But being a science fiction writer for most people is the same as being unemployed, so I'd always looked in other directions for a career. A few years, I might do physics, then I might do economics, I might do theater, I might do dance, all sorts of things. And normally, I'm okay with that. I really enjoy switching from field to field. But this time, I had a problem. I traveled all the way to the United States to go to college. I'd taken on enormous student loans. I was about to graduate, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I thought about it and decided there was only one thing that made sense. I would go to Wall Street, become an investment banker, and get filthy rich. Now, as it happened, some other people came up with the same idea. <laughs> so it wasn't that easy. It took months and months and hundreds of emails and hundreds of phone conversations and all this running around. And in the end, I got one interview, one chance to make it work. The bank flew me to New York, and I interviewed at this big, gray, cold corporate office, hour after hour. They asked me personal questions, they asked me finance questions, they asked me math questions. You know the annoying sort they ask you in school, like there are 11 dwarves sitting around a table, and three of them have red caps, and seven of them have green caps, and like, what is the average number of dwarves who get up for a bathroom break? I don't know, like this sort of stuff, I really hate. But I dealt with it all, and at the end of the day, I was feeling pretty good. But then I had to sit down with this top banker, this big shot guy. I'm going to call him Chuck. And Chuck took one look at my resume, and he said, you know what? I really don't think you're made for Wall Street. I mean, look at this. One day you're doing econ, the next day you're doing physics, and then you're doing theater. You're all over the place. We need people with more focus. I was scared. I mean, I'd spent all these months, all this time, getting to this point. Now this one guy was telling me I wasn't going to make it. But I thought about it, and I told him, actually, it all makes perfect sense. All my life, I've wanted to be a banker, so I studied economics. But my analytical side was kind of weak, so I did physics. And I realized my people skills could use some work, so I added acting to round that out. He said, OK, I suppose I see how that makes sense. But it says here that you're a science fiction writer. Now, how does a science fiction writer fit into Wall Street? What kind of sense does that make? At that point, I took a risk. I looked at him and I said, you know what, being a science fiction writer is what lets me take these unconnected things, really unconnected, like econ and physics and theater, and put them together in a story and convince you that I was heading to Wall Street all along. Now, he spent quite a while thinking about that, <laughs> but then he laughed. I really, I think he was just watching to see what my reaction would be if he kept quiet, but then he laughed and said, you know, that's what I do every day. <laughs> and he helped me get hired. I spent four years on Wall Street. There were the years of the financial crisis. It was a pretty um, unpleasant time to be there. I was on this trading floor the size of two football fields with thousands of people when the Dow Jones fell 700 points and everybody was panicking, when Lehman Brothers collapsed, went under, and there was screaming and yelling. But the days I really remember, and this happened all the time, I'd be sitting there at my computer, and I'd hear this sound, and it would be people clapping very politely. And I'd look up, and there'd be some poor guy with a cardboard box just walking off the, off the floor, and smiling and nodding at everybody and shaking hands, but you knew this guy had screwed up, and he'd gotten fired, or let go, as they say politely, and probably his career was over. Because in this environment, if you were a mid-range or a senior banker, and if you screwed up and lost your job, getting a new job was very difficult. It was enough to screw up once, and you could literally lose your career. But here's the interesting thing. Over my time on Wall Street, I followed Chuck's career, like this big shot who hired me. And the first year I was there, he lost money, and he didn't get fired. 
So I was like, how is this possible? And I asked people, what happened? And apparently, Chuck convinced his bosses, yes, this was a tough year, it was a hard year, but I have a really great product coming. It's coming online next year, we're going to make so much money, we're going to all you know, really make millions. And he convinced everybody, so they let him stay on. Now, the next year, Chuck lost money again. And again, he didn't get fired. So I asked, how is this possible? Apparently, he said, OK, yes, this year we spent, we worked really hard. We set up our new product. We hired the best people in the industry. Now we're really ready, poised to make money. Now the important thing is we have to keep the team together. We can't lose anybody. So not only did he not get fired, he got his team paid bonuses. <laughs> A lot of other people who had not made money, or who had made money, rather, did not get paid bonuses that year, but he got them some bonuses so he could keep the team together. Now, the third year, he lost money again, and he got fired. <laughs> you can only tell stories so long. Eventually, you have to actually do something. <laughs> now, I don't know if he was just a manipulator, if he was just lying to get, make some money, or if he really believed in his product and it just didn't work out. Storytelling of this sort can be used for good and for bad like any tool. But I do know that he wasn't lying. He really did use storytelling in everyday life. He was a master at this essential storytelling skill, which is taking events that happen to you and separating them from the meaning they have. Whatever happened to him, he found the best possible story to tell about that, the most useful story to him. Now, this is a skill that's really useful in business, it's really useful in personal life, and also in writing. So to illustrate that, I'm going to talk about giant robots. <laughs> a few years into my Wall Street career, I decided to make my childhood dreams come true and finally write that book about giant robots. And here's the plot. It's really very simple. Giant robots take over the world. This kid discovers he has superpowers, and he goes to fight the giant robots. Not much to the plot. Now, the first impression when you hear something like that is probably like a sort of uh, Michael Bay sort of movie, like action, giant robots crashing across town, exterminate, exterminate, that sort of thing. Lots of special effects. You can just imagine stuff blowing up. And that's one way you could tell a story. But there's another way. There's many other ways. For example, you could tell a giant robot story a la Hemingway. You know that there are these battles, it's all happening, but you never see them. What you see is the morning before the giant robot battle, when this kid is sitting with his mom, and he's eating pancakes, and they talk about the pancakes, and they talk about the weather, and they never mention the battle or anything, but you know what they're thinking about. And then later, you see this scene where you see this giant robot sitting in a, or standing in a field of wild roses, and this bird lands on his shoulder, and it's all very peaceful and beautiful. And you know, we never see the battle, but it's this beautiful art house sort of giant robot novel. You could do that. What I ended up doing was a combination of the two. But even that isn't the last choice. I could have made it a comedy. I could have made it hard science fiction, all about the engineering. There are so many choices. With the same plot, with the same events, I can tell any number of different stories. It's one of my favorite things about being a writer. Now, but the beautiful thing is, we don't have to be writers to do this. Every day, stuff happens to us, and we tell stories about what happens to us. And we have this very same freedom. And if we learn to use it, it brings enormous benefits. Now, the stories we tell to others, it's pretty easy. That's what Chuck did. Bad things happen to you. If you can spin a good story and sell everybody else on how this is an opportunity, obviously, you benefit in a professional sense and in a personal sense. But really, even more important to me are the stories you tell yourself. Every day, things happen to us, good things and bad things, and we tell ourselves stories about what happens to us. Most of the time, on autopilot, we do it automatically. And these stories form our identity. They form our idea of who we are. Let's say we lose some money in business, we might think of ourselves as a failure in business. I fail a test in university, I'm such a bad student. We make these automatic judgments. Something happens, and we decide what the meaning is. There is a lot of value to be gained by becoming a storyteller and realizing that there's a difference between the things that happen to us and what they actually mean. So if you remember back in 2006, 
I realized physics wasn't working out. So I kind of rejigged my life and moved on to uh, finance. I became this banker. I changed the story of my life. Now, this funny thing happened. It was 2011, and I'd spent four years on Wall Street. I had a good career. I'd made a reasonable amount of money. I'd paid off those student loans. If I kept going, I could probably go on to be quite rich and have quite a stable career. But here's what was happening. I spent all day in the office working, and then, because I was a writer, I went home and I wrote all night. I spent all day inside, hardly, with, with hardly any social contact apart from my colleagues. I was spending my 20s locked in various rooms, and at some point I just realized, this isn't working for me. This doesn't make sense for me anymore. My life has stopped making sense again. And, you know, that was kind of a tough moment. It was a bit depressing, to be honest. Because, like everything I'd done in my life, I'd never, it, seems like, it seemed to me like I never was able to stick with anything. I did it for a few years, then I lost interest. And I did something else for a few years, and I lost interest in that. And, you know, I, it just made me feel like I was failing in a professional sense. I couldn't find something to really keep me going, like, some, like other people. I couldn't find a single passion, a single career to keep me going. But in, in this moment, when I was feeling low and, and really kind of bad about my life, I took a step back and I asked myself, OK, so if this was happening in my giant robot novel or some other novel, if a character was in this situation where you know, they switch from field to field and they can't decide what to do, would I, as a writer, look at that, OK, that's the end of the story, oh, so sad, what is he going to do? I would, as a writer, that would not, never be the end of the story. It would just be a turning point. It would be leading up to some climax of decision-making, some internal change that would have, have to happen in the main character on the way to ultimate uh, triumph, hopefully. And when I thought about it this way, it made me think, OK, let's take a step back and see. You have the events of your life, and you have the meaning. So the events that I could see were, I kept switching from field to field. Nothing kept my attention very long. And my instinctual reaction about the meaning had been that I just couldn't stick with anything, that I was uh, failing professionally. But there are other stories you can tell about this. And once I realized that, everything sort of moved into place. All my life, I had wanted to be a writer. I never thought it was realistic, but I'd wanted it all my life. Now, when I thought about that, it made sense that I would switch from field to field because writers need lots of input for their writing. Now, after all these years, I hadn't actually failed. I'd gotten a lot of different areas of, well, not expertise exactly, but a lot of areas of experience I could go on to use in my writing. And these last years on Wall Street, they weren't just, they weren't just about another area of expertise or experience. They gave me, finally gave me those financial real-life skills to support my dream. Using this, I could finally go on and uh, make my dream reality, focus on what I al always wanted to focus on. Now, when I had this realization, it was really this huge sense of relief. Just as I realized that I no longer felt like I'd failed, I saw how my life made sense from a different angle. But this is not just about psychology. Like this sto these stories we tell ourselves, it's not about making yourself feel better. They have a measurable impact. They give us new paths forward. The very next day after I had this realization, I went to my job, uh, went to my boss and told him I was quitting and I was moving back home to Latvia to write. The very next day, not in a week, not in a month, because I saw that this made sense, this new story made sense. The past few years, I've lived here. Now, with a decision this big, you can never say it was the right one, it was the wrong one. You, can, you can't compare with what might have been if you, if you would acted otherwise. But I can say that these have been really happy uh, years, that I'm really satisfied with the story I've been living here, teaching business classes to make a little bit of money and focusing on my passion, which is writing. They have been really good years, and I've been able to find, these, find this opportunity by looking at the story of my life, realizing it didn't make sense, and then understanding that the story of my life wasn't the only possible story of my life. 
that I could find a different one that made more sense to me, that felt right to me. And that's what I did. Now, it's easy to make this sound like all neat and wrapped up. Oh, great, he figured out the meaning of his life and yay. Of course, life doesn't work this way. I have, like most people, crisis of doubt uh, and you know, ver ver uh, various worries on a regular basis about where my life is going and what I'm doing. But I use this tool now. When I have these worries or doubts, when my life stops making sense, I remind myself to think about giant robots. Because I really think it's a good mnemonic for life. We may all have to fight giant robots, but we can each decide what giant robots mean to us. Thank you.